Hi everybody and welcome to the National Religious Broadcasters Meeting here at the Gaylord Convention Center. We're so excited. Today we have a really inspirational lady on our program. Her name is Jacqueline Eloff. You might know her as the woman who produced and distributed the film Jesus His Life on History Channel. She's also a senior advisor and minister for Joel Olstein Ministries at Lakewood Church. So without further ado, let's dive in and listen to Jacqueline Eloff, and you'll want to hear about her book, What If I Could? So come right back. Welcome everybody back. We're so excited to have on our set a special guest today. We have Jacqueline Iloff in the, in we're at NRB actually, National Religious Broadcasters Convention. And I'm so excited to have you. I've oh, read part you. of your book. I'm getting ready to read all of it. But you have a wonderful book. You're a producer for movies. So I want to dive in and first I'll just introduce the book that she's currently has available called What If You Could? What If I Could? That's right, What If You Could? So that's your theme, sort of. You're a positive, motivational person. What if someone could? I wrote the book because, you know, God is a God of possibilities, a God of encouragement, and, and He wants you to be the best that you can be. And I thought, well, most people think, oh, I could never do that, or I could never be this, or I could never grow up to be that. And it, that's just the opposite. What if you could? What if you could do anything you wanted to? What is it that you would do? What is it that you could accomplish? What is it that you could influence the world uh, over? And so I wrote this book and it was truly inspirational. I wrote it in 90 days. It was just kind of a God download. That's amazing. And, uh, and it's full of scripture. Um, everything that I say in there is based on biblical tenets. Uh, it's not just my opinion, it's God's opinion, of you particularly. And uh, so that's what I say, you know, why, why base your life in fear and trepidation and holding back when God at your side can do all things through you, with you, and for you? So why not? What if you could? And so the, your life is an example of that. Early on, God put you on a journey, right? God put it in my heart to, um, I, I don't know, to be an influence. And I didn't know it at, a, at that young age, you know, at 18, 19, 20 years old. I just knew I had this drive to do something. And um, I started out thinking I was going to be a producer. And God had other plans for me. So um, I also loved politics. I had grown up uh, in a very conservative household. My parents are Cuban-Americans. And so, uh, you know, we were 100% behind uh, the conservative perspective here in this country. Um, so I got involved in politics through a, f a family friend and it took me to Washington DC and I got to be part of the Reagan administration and part of the Bush quail uh, campaign for president and, and beyond that uh, you know I worked on tort reform uh, for the, a group of accountants uh, the big five accounting firms. How old and, were you when you went to Washington DC? How old were you? Oh I can't tell you that. <laughs> But you were I was young. in my 20s, yes. I, was I mean, you were young going to Washington, D.C., and that, I mean, I could picture me being that young, being a little overwhelmed by that world, and you probably had a little hesitation of fear, maybe, and you had to learn to overcome that, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, on a daily basis, I was in the middle of uh, meetings that, that if you looked in the news, you know, they were making statements that evening on what we were talking about in, in the boardrooms where I worked. I worked at the RNC and then um, uh, reaching out to the media uh, to tell them about what the administration was doing because in those days, I'm old enough to say, there was no social media. You had to create it yourself. You know, you had to put it down the wires. So I would write the stories about what the administration was doing and send it out into the wires. And uh, hopefully they, it got picked up and most of the time it did. 
Um, and then I went to work for the Public Affairs Office of the Department of Transportation under Elizabeth Dole. And what okay, a treat Elizabeth Dole. that was. Yeah, she's what a phenomenal female to work under. Uh, just a mentor a, probably at that time to you, right? It, it, she, she's an amazing lady. We're still friends, I'm glad to say. Um, she's doing great work with the veterans and, uh, with uh, PTSD and, um, and their wives who are their caretakers. She's got a foundation in Washington called the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. Um, and it's an amazing uh, organization. So, you know, uh, my life I thought was going to be all about Washington, D.C. and politics, but again, the Lord intervened and um, my brother-in-law, Joel Osteen, um, had, at the time, he wasn't in ministry yet. He owned a television station that he had put out to, to, um, to promote inspirational and uplifting family TV that you could watch. So there's a theme here that you'll see in a minute. So wait, you married when you were in Washington, D.C., right? Yes, I met my husband on the Bush Quail campaign. You met your husband, mm -hmm. and so that's how you got connected to Joel Olstein, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So and, and, and it's a funny story because on Sunday nights, the last thing I would watch was the John Osteen broadcast. That's Joel's dad. Exactly. And you married John Osteen, or no, yeah, you married Victoria's brother. Correct. Okay, Correct. trying to make the connection. <laughs> I know, it's a change. <laughs> God was pouring into me what I, he knew I was going to need later on. Through Joel's dad. You were listening exactly. to his sermons. Because I, I had grown up Catholic. Uh, but I, I was, did too. But I was always I seeking the Lord. I, was, you know, I wanted the answers that, that I wasn't getting in the curriculum that I had received in school. And so um, I was watching him and he was really such a great teacher. He and Kenneth Copeland were my spiritual godfathers. They taught me everything I know about standing on the word and, and what God has for me and, uh, and says about me. So um, I met my husband, uh, we had a child, and, um, and Joel called uh, Don and said, I need you in Houston. He, he's originally, my husband is originally from Houston, he grew up there, and he said, come, come work with me at the station, and I was like, Oh, no, 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 no. I was, at the time, the Mid-Atlantic uh, Public Relations Director for KPMG, one of the big five uh, accounting firms, and I was like, I'm not leaving this job. This is a dream job. And I said, if this is God, there will be an opening in the Houston office for my position. Well, we moved to Houston. Never, <laughs> neither there was an say. opening for your position. God took us to Houston, and um, he worked at the television station with, with Joel for about two or three years, and then uh, John's dad, uh, Joel's dad, John, passed away, and Joel took the ministry. And of course, everyone knows the story about, you know, what's happened with Joel and uh, and his amazing ministry. And we were a part of it. Both my husband and I work for the ministry, and uh, we're we're loving it. Uh, what is your role there now? I'm a special projects advisor, so I bring things that. Um, at Lakewood kind of, Church, yes, okay, uh, for for Joel Osteen Ministries, uh, and uh, and so I, I do things like Generation Hope Project, which brings volunteers to a major city where we've done um, big uh, stadium events, and so we bring about 300, 500 people, put them to work in the community, have them, you know, fix homes, um, restore parks, oh, that's uh, wonderful. Work at the food bank. Compassionate ministries. It's it's an it's such a wonderful thing. It's the stories I could tell you about the things that have happened, not because of what I did, but because of what God was doing in those places. And just a quick story: there was a gentleman, um, there was a church in New York that had suffered damage from Sandy, uh, the, the hurricane. Hurricane. And and so we went there and we toured it just to make sure you know what was needed, a little advance work, and it. I was looking at it and there were stars of David and all kinds of stuff that were indicative of this used to be a synagogue. And the, the pastor who had bought it from the, from the, the Jewish community had uh, now become uh, a, a, a non-denominational Christian church. And so we were in there f fixing it up. And so I came around to, to check on what was going on during the day while we were, while they were fixing it up. And uh, the, one of, the, one of my uh, staff people comes up to me and he says, you're not going to believe this story. And I'm like, okay, tell me. So we had a volunteer. We had put a volunteer in that church who, as a young man, had been Jewish and had gotten bar mitzvahed at that church and now was there 
to help restore it to the house of God, to Jesus Christ. Wow, that's I mean, amazing. It gives me chills about what God, God is, doesn't miss a beat. His, his tapestry amazing. is perfect. You know, he just weaves things in and, and there's story after story of, of compassion and, and hearts changing and, and people coming to forgiveness because of the Generation Hope Project. And I'm very proud of that. You know, with COVID, unfortunately, all of that ceased. And so now we're Picking you know, back trying up. to figure out what comes next in the ministry. Uh, but he also gave me another wonderful, wonderful project called Lakewood Church Movie Night. And once a month, we preview movies that are going to be out in the public that are inspirational, faith-filled. You know, we've had the Kendricks that are wins. Um, you just had a guest here, uh, Pat, Pat Boone, Boone. The Mulligan movie. We are definitely going to showcase that. We just had um, Edward James Olmos and uh, George Lopez in Walking with Herb. I have a small piece in that film. Oh, you do? I play the, the pastor who's doing the, the, the funeral at the beginning of this. So if you blink, you miss me, but I'm in there. <laughs> and it was such a joy to work with them. You know, all these faith-filled people who are just trying to get that message out to a public who who some are very faith-filled and want to see that on the screen, but some are, are seekers like I was. And if we can plant that seed and, and watch it grow through the Lakewood Movie Ministry, uh, we've had such wonderful stories of families reconciling because of the movie that they came to see at Lakewood. Or there, there's this one young man who is in a wheelchair and, and obviously very uh, limited in his capabilities. Um, and he was, he's, his parents brought him because they thought the movie that we were showing would be something he would enjoy. And he came and you could see him, he was, he was very downcast and very withdrawn and you know, very you know, inside of himself. And he came to the movie and we engaged him and you know, how did you like the movie? And we put him on camera and he, he started blossoming. And he started coming every, every week, every, every month rather. And as he became more and more outwardly focused and seeing that things could happen to somebody, but that God can restore them and, and, and bring them to their fulfilled life, he, he started volunteering in other parts of the ministry. He became an ambassador for the, the movie night. Um, He's he, flourishing. He just came out of himself and he became all that he could be, you know, even though he was still limited, he, he realized that, you know, people cared about him, wanted his input, that he was a vital part of the, the fabric of the church. And so we're, those, those are the kinds of things that we're very proud of doing. Lakewood Movie Night is not just about entertainment, it's about ministering to people. And, uh, and right now, um, you know, God, because he is faithful, um, brought me around to being able to produce things. We, my husband and I were uh, producers on a project with Joel. Uh, he was executive producer, uh, along with my husband, uh, called uh, Jesus, uh, His, His Life. Life. And that right. was on uh, Phenomenal. The, the that was on channel. the History Channel. Yeah. Yes, and you all out there need to see this. Yeah. Jesus, His Life, and it won awards. Yes. Like, yes. this is a phenomenal uh, show. I was going to bring that up because... That's when I met you a couple of years ago, you were promoting that. Yep. Um, so we highly recommend the audience to see this. But uh, And it comes back, you know, every Easter they, they bring it back because it's a, it's a great Easter series. And, but we're very, very proud of that. And, and again, what if you could? What if you could, you know, what if you asked, you know, God said, I want to do this or that, I want to be a producer. You know, little did I know that when I left Southern California in 19, Something. Something. <laughs> uh, in the 80s that he was going to fulfill that dream of mine of being a producer these low many years later. Because um, you went to the political scene, then you got married, then you went with your husband and you were in the accounting scene yep. in that arena. Mm -hmm. And then, then he brought you full circle back to your heart's desire years ago to yeah. be in production and producer of yeah. movies. Yeah, and now... Did you ever think that whole circle was going to happen? You know, one day I was... Um, cleaning out some paperwork that I had left at my grandmother's and I started looking at all the things that I had done while I was in California and how it took me to Washington and I realized then that God knew every step I was going to take so I, I assume that if he knew then he knows now um, he knows every step I'm going to take and he is faithful to my heart's desire 
And as long as I'm faithful to him, there's nothing I can't do. Because yeah. nothing is impossible with God. Exactly, exactly. You, you have a new project you're working on. Tell us about your new project. Oh my gosh. This or will... one of the new projects. You probably <laughs> have many. Well, um, yes. Right now, I'm, I'm working with a group of incredibly talented, I would say genius entrepreneurs that are putting together uh, an organization called Zash.Global. It's a... Zash. A Zash, like, uh, like, yeah, like cash, but with a Z. And um, I, if you haven't heard about it yet, you will soon because it's it's going to be uh, an exciting global entertainment company. Um, almost everyone that that is on the team is a, a faith-filled believer, and if they aren't, they are shortly getting going into to that be, group because you're going to convert them. <laughs> Just because of the the influence that we have right. in the group, we're we're all. Focused. Well, it's hard not to become a Christian yeah. if you're around all these people that are so inspiring and faith-filled. Exactly, exactly. But it's a global company, um, and uh, and it's crazy. I mean, we we have the, the the top of the food chain. I like to say, in terms of technology capabilities, in terms of outreach capabilities, uh, this is a company that's focused on the entertainment world. Um, we are we are determined to change culture just the way other entities have changed it in a certain direction, we want to change it in a certain direction. So we have the influence, the money, and the wherewithal to do it. And Are these going to be movies? It's going to be or movies. TV series? All of everything. It's, TV it's a, series, it's movies? It's a multi-dimensional multi global entertainment company. If you talk about social media, we have the third largest media company in the world. Wow. It's called Lamoda. Um, if you're talking about short Form content. We have one of the premier, we have the one that worked in, when Quibi didn't work, um, and it's got Fitco. And um, they just it, did a program that went to 800, I'm not kidding, 800 million households in India. That's awesome. It's, and, and to be, I mean, to be India in that, is so needed, right? Yes, in, to know Jesus and Christianity, that's wonderful. And, and we don't go in there, you know, um, full frontal attack. It's a it's a much more subtle uh, way of, of delivering the yes delivering the message to be an influence in the culture and uh, and I think that's you know there's a saying and, and I hope this isn't this isn't terrible but uh, you boil a frog a little at a time you turn up the heat a little at a time well you know we we want to change the way the world thinks about. Jesus Christ. We want to change the world uh, view on that they're alone, that there is a darkness, that you know that we're so divided. We want to bring people together and to entertainment unify. is the best way to do that. To educate, entertain, unify, uplift, all of those things can happen through media and this company is focused on that. Um, they've bought a lot of secular companies but there's one company that kind of uh, is set aside. It's called FaithX, and FaithX is the exchange of information uh, on all platforms. We have music, films, um, books, podcasts. Uh, we have a page called Testimony, which is like a TED Talk. We have concert events. We have games. Everything is in, and it's coming. I mean, we're just building it. So give us a it's minute. Phenomenal. But um, but this is a this is a huge startup. And we're so, so proud of it. Um, the team that has been um, brought together um, are, are seasoned professionals from the movie industry, um, marketers, former executives of studios. Um, um, How can the viewers that are listening connect with this? Go what to zash.global. Go to zash.global. We'll put that on the screen. And in September, um, it, you can see FaithX. We're, we're launching in September, so this is a little preview of things to come. We haven't even announced uh, officially yet, but um, this is, it's just so exciting. And you know, we, we're talking to a lot of the people here at NRB who are uh, content providers, filmmakers, producers, and, um, and they're excited too. They, they, they can see the opportunity. We're living in a time with the movies and The Chosen and what you're bringing about. We're living in a time where to be a Christian is becoming cool. 
it's becoming more acceptable and embraced and I love it that it's influencing the world. Yes. Coming out of the US too. And you're working on a book. Oh yes. Another and, book. And this this is my favorite part and I and I'm um, I'm excited because I'm partnering with Jerry Pattengill, who is a former, uh, formidable um, professor and, and, and theologian in all things uh, historical, biblical, and, uh, things of that sort. He's a scholar, um, and uh, he and I are partnering on a book called The Women in Jesus' Life. Oh. There are very few people who understand how important the women in his life were to his ministry. They hear the stories and, and they think, oh, that's a wonderful example of whatever the lesson is that mm -hmm. they're trying to show. But from the very beginning, before God sent down his only son, he had, he had chosen key women to carry that lineage that would ultimately be the birth of Jesus Christ. Right. And, um, and, they were, and even after he left us, um, he used women to further his ministry. You know, we were we were some of the original fundraisers for the ministry. That, right, that Priscilla mm -hmm. taught, and Lydia became the worshiper. Became, yeah. I mean, exactly. I'm excited. I exactly. cannot wait to read this book. Oh, it's uh, it's been fun researching it. Now, now I just have to weave the narrative, and of course, Jerry's going to co come in with all the real historical facts and put things in perspective. Did you for? I mean, did you see how Jesus set things up? for those women as you're studying? Yes, because to me, God, God speaks to me very presently. And, um, you know, in, in a culture where women were set aside and dismissed, I was just reading Timothy this morning, and um, the letter was saying, you know, women should be seen and not heard. And I thought that's not what God originally planned. Maybe in this context and in this lesson, he was, he was speaking to, uh, the pastors in that city um, so maybe that lesson applied but but ultimately God speaks to women he uses women he he sees them as equal he created them as equal right you know not less than and and throughout that throughout this book I, I want to illustrate that, that that women have had a vital role that he created us male and female that's right not Ezra. male and or female not also female but he created us and together with man to to take this world and and further his creation and ultimately that's our responsibility is to further his creation to manifest what he saw and what he believed we were made to be right so yes. even though we're fallen now we have been redeemed so now we can take the mantle back up again and I, I think it's important for women to have that voice and to understand their responsibility in God's creation. So anyway, it's exciting to me. You're like me. You see everything with the cup overflowing. Yeah. You know, God can do anything and he can. We know that. But tell me, can you look back over your life and say, uh, you know, this was a difficult situation, a difficult trial that God worked out. Mm -hmm. Can you share with the public something that you can? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think I, I touch on it in my book. There was a period of time where, um, when I came to Houston, um, they decided to change the public affairs offices of KPMG to Dallas. And I had just gotten to Houston. I couldn't move again and I wasn't going to take my family to Dallas when, when our mission was to be in Houston. So I found myself out of work and even though I'm resourceful and I, I took a, a consultant position here and there, just to keep my hand in things. My, little, my girls were very young. They were under six years old. And so I found myself a single, not a single mom, but a very isolated mother at home with two young children. My husband was building a television station. He was gone most of the day. He didn't get home until seven or eight o'clock sometimes. And, and by then, you know, all he wanted to do was play with the girls and go to sleep. And, it was, you know, we, even though we tried to do date nights and stuff, it was still very isolating. I didn't know very many people in Houston. The only people I knew were his family. My family lived in Florida and California. So there was, there was nothing for me to anchor myself with except God. And, um, and it, I can remember talking to God saying, Lord, what, what is this? Why, why do you have me here? 
because I was at the point of tears sometimes. I don't know if you've been a, a mom of young children. Absolutely. There's and you're no, driven and you have so many things you want to do. And you pour all yourself yes. into them. And at the end of the day, you're like, what am I doing? There's nobody to talk to. There's nobody to exchange ideas with. You know, once they get into school, then you have a, a network of females that, and, and parents that you can commiserate with. But it was very hard. And I asked God, what, you know, why do you have me here? And he said, I have you here for a season. Just be faithful in this season. And I thought, okay. And then around that time, 9-11 um, happened. And we were watching horrible scenes of, of children um, being hit by shrapnel and, and debris from bombings in Iraq. And, and I, I saw this one episode of this little girl who was not going to die from her injuries, but because there was no medical capabilities to handle her injuries, she, she was at risk of dying from uh, the infection that might uh, incur from it. And I thought, oh Lord, I walked, I walked over and I prayed over. I said, please, Lord, take care of her. You know, that could be my child. And I, my heart was just so saddened for those parents. And I said, oh God, please take care of her. And as I'm walking out of the room, I hear him say to me internally, so what are you going to do? I was like, what am I, I don't, I can't do anything, Lord. I'm here in Houston. I don't know anybody. I, he says, you have a Rolodex full of people you know in Washington. You have everything that you need to do something about this. Oh, wow. That was a powerful moment. It was. It, it was life-changing. And, um, and what, what... You opened your eyes through that situation. Well, yeah, because one person can make a difference, no matter what your situation is, is, is what he was telling me. Even though you're being faithful to those children, and God bless them, they're in their 20s now, and... I am so, so proud of them. They're such incredible human beings. I'm, I'm thrilled that they're my children. But, um, but he gave me the ability to go out and I picked up the phone and I started talking to the people that I did know in Houston. And they led me to opportunities to create a, a, a container, a, a cargo container full of medical supplies, which we got to Iraq. Oh, that's amazing. And, you know, he always pours into you what you're going to need. And you don't even know it, but you, he pull, knows. You, you, know, you pull that out of the backpack and go, wow, there it is. That's such an encouraging word to end on. Um, get her book, this book, What If You Could? But um, it's an encouraging word. You'll want to read this book. It's a, it's a quick read uh, because it's very inspirational. You won't be able to put it down. Um, she, you. you are just a phenomenal uh, source for the kingdom of God, Thank compassionate you. and helping people. And what an honor uh, to meet you today oh, well, or you. see you again. Thank I saw you. you in California, yeah. but nice to be here. I'm just so grateful to have you on the program and thank you for all you're doing. Oh, well, thank you for having me and allowing me to speak with you. It's been a real pleasure. I love, I love talking about what God can do. And thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's our pleasure and joy. Mm -hmm.